This is uh, my kitchen table and also my filing system. Over much of the past three decades, I've been an investor. The highest calling of mankind, I've often thought, was private equity. <laughs> and then I started interviewing. Well, I watch your interview because I know how to do some interviews. <laughs> I've learned in doing my interviews how leaders make it to the top. I asked him how much he wanted. He said 250. I said fine. I didn't negotiate with him. I did no due diligence. Told I have me. something I'd like to sell, <laughs> and how they stay there. You don't feel inadequate now because being only the second wealthiest man in the world is that right? Over the past several decades, one of the most successful hedge fund investors in the world has been Ray Dalio. Ray Dalio has built Bridgewater into the largest single hedge fund in the world, managing more than $100 billion. He's also an accomplished author. In his most recent book, The Changing World Order, talks about the rising China and the sinking United States. I had a chance to talk to him recently about that book and many other things relating to the investment world. Ray, thank you very much for coming and uh, for writing this book. We're going to talk about this principally this evening. Um, I wanted to start, though, by asking you uh, this. You're running the largest hedge fund in the world, more than $150 billion. How do you have time to write books when you are in running that hedge fund? Uh, I didn't write either of those books, really. Uh, what I did was, uh, this book was, um, in order to understand what was going on today, I needed to do a study. Right. And what I experienced in life many times before is that the surprises that happened to me were things that never happened in my lifetime, but happened many times in history. When you read the book, as I have, and I, I enjoyed it, it took me uh, a couple of sittings to get through because it's a lot of detail in here. Um, you have a lot of historians that help you because a lot of history in here, history I didn't know. You have historians um, yeah, that help you? I'm so lucky because I'm, I get to speak to so many people who are historians, who are practitioners, you know, people in different countries, Henry Kissinger, Graham Allison, you know, just um, scientists and so on, and then historians. So, and then I have a fabulous research team. So I go into this learning immersion, um, and then, um, and I iterate with it. I show them what I've got, they come back, and that's the process. Okay, so you have, uh in here, people who have said good things about the book, including a number of Treasury secretaries, Hank Paulson, Tim Geithner, Larry Summers. Hard to get three Treasury secretaries to agree on anything, but you did. But you also have very favorable comments about the book from Henry Kissinger and Bill Gates. You know both of them? Yeah. All right, who's smarter? <laughs> well, I think, um, I think that they would say, the, each would say the other guy. And I think I would say that, um, each in their own ways. Okay. So, boy, you should go into politics or diplomacy. <laughs> okay. Your view is there are three big cycles in history. Is that fair? More or less? Yeah, I, I, I came with the three things that are happening today, and then I found that there are really five. Okay. But the three, three big ones, yeah. All right, so let's go through the first cycle. The first cycle is when an economy comes together, gets wealthy, people are building up the economy, and eventually they build it up so much they borrow more money than maybe they should and they dilute their currency. Is that fair? Yeah, I could do it in a quicker way. Quicker There's, than that? Well, uh, excuse me, better than that. Better than that, okay, <laughs> no doubt. Um, there is, um, there's a new order. There's, a, there's usually some fight uh, between the left and the right or it could be foreign countries and whatever new order. And then when that begins, it's sort of a great equalizer. And capitalism, is a, a fantastic enabler because what it does is it gives people who may not have anything, who have good ideas, capital, so they get the resources to pursue that, and that's a fabulous thing. And then as it rises over a period of time, you'll see debt to income ratios rise and so on because everybody gets more funded because uh, debt is buying power and everybody wants more buying power. And then also you see it naturally dis, um, uh, distributes wealth unequally, and it distributes opportunity unequally. So um, as that wealth gaps rise and widen, and then also the, because it's parents can who have wealthy parents can educate their children in an unfair, let's, let's say, an unequal way relative to others, and so but it, get over, it gets overly indebted, and then because all this buying power, which comes in the form of debt, is somebody else's assets. 
then what happens is um, then you lower interest rates, you try to stimulate it. So for example, since 1980, every cyclical peak and every cyclical trough in interest rates was lower than the one before it so that they can stimulate more debt. And then when you get to zero interest rates, that doesn't work. So they have to print money and they buy money to keep get that pile going up and that creates the cycle, okay? So there's part of that cycle which is a capital markets or, uh, and the, by the way, this exists almost everywhere, and then with that, th and then you see the monetization of debt and so on, and with that, uh, there are also conflicts. Conflicts that are the wealth conflicts and related to that, the political left and the political right, and there and that creates the dynamic that we're talking about. Right. Now you've cited in your book uh, two examples where this has happened before. One is in the Netherlands where the Dutch economy ultimately, they had the only reserve currency, at least in Western Europe, the Gilder, and they did some of what you now say we're doing, is that right? The yeah, it, the same patterns over and over again. They had, in the beginning, big education, they won a war, then they became very competitive, they went out in the world taking their goods and they built ships that were the best ships around the world so they can go anywhere in the world. They brought their arms with them and they made a fortune. And with that, they brought their currency. And as they bring their currency, because it's a world currency, a reserve currency, others want to own it. And because others want to own it, because that's buying power, it's the common wampum, and then because of that, um, then they lend it to the Dutch. So in other words, Americans get lent money because others want to hold dollars, and then that allows us, that's the exorbitant privilege, to get more and more in debt. And then what happens is they lose their competitiveness. The British built, came along and copied from the Dutch and found, oh, they can make ships better and cheaper. And then they became the competitors. And then as the competitors are operating, they take market share away, quite similar to uh, lots of technology companies and what's going on now. And then uh, what happens is then they get more in debt and then they have the other cycle that's t operating and then you have the challenges of that. Oh, so they had the Dutch, they typified by the Dutch tulip bulb craze where people were spending a lot of guilders buying tulip bulbs, right? So that imploded and the British came in and they built a big economy and then they kind of went south a bit. They had the same exact currency. pattern. And then we came along, the United States um, became the biggest economy in the world around 1870 and since World War II, we've been the dominant economy. So now we have a lot of debt, you'd say? Yeah. Uh, 29 trillion? Good. About that? So how are we going to pay off that debt, by the way? Well, um, Inflation is the only way? In the end, it's always Inflation. print the money. Okay. You know, it's always print the money. Because you see, the, one man's debts are another man's assets. And so if you're holding a bond and you receive a you don't get compensated for inflation. Let's say people think cash is a low investment, uh, low risk investment. Well, they're earning no interest. And when you have a 7% or a 5% inflation, you lose 5% of your buying power. Or if you're owning a bond, you have the same thing. And so what happens is not only is there the debt that is coming from the new debt created to run the deficits, right but they become sellers of that debt because the owner, as an asset, it's not a good asset. And then there's so much selling. And what that means is that you either have to, interest rates have got to go up, or, and then that grinds things down to a close, or what they do is they have to print money. And so the history of all of these cycles is that the coffers are, uh, are empty because you can't continue to spend more than you earn and give it to somebody, expect them to like it, and then you devalue it and that becomes the cycle. And so you see the classic cycle of the ingredient is um, you, uh, you, the cycle I'm talking about in terms of supply, demand, and the, and the All right, debt. So what you wanted to do is presumably let people know this is occurring so maybe they could take action by letting their congressmen or governors know something about this or not? Well, I think there are two, two things. What you can do to make a better society in your contribution, but also how you can individually take care of yourself in a situation that might be difficult. Okay, so uh, let's finish on the, the third part of the cycle. The third part of the cycle is somebody's rising up, and right now you would say China's rising up. Is that correct? It, 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 there's just numbers, and you look at it. And, okay, so yeah. if I want to do something about it, and I want to live in a time when China is not rising up so much, and we, we're better off in the U.S. economy, what should I do? Should I lobby my members of Congress not to print so much money? What should I do about it, if anything? 
Um, well, again, it's... There's, there's, or the cycles are such, I think, you can't do much. If, I think if we go back and we look at history, uh, there are three ba main things that you can do, okay? Uh, first, uh, as a society, individually and then collectively, um, how do you earn more money than you spend? And how do you build a balance sheet that has more assets than liabilities? That's a healthy, and so keeping that m in mind. The second is um, internal conflict or cooperation. Can you have internal cooperation because you realize what the consequences are? So I think that in the 2024 elections, there is a reasonable chance that neither party will accept losing the elections. And that is something that means that democracy or a type of civil war of sorts could develop in a way, this is r realistic, I'm not being um, exaggerated by that, and when one looks at those types of things, there is a worry that one should have about the divisiveness and what it means for each other, and the same is true internationally. So basically, if you, anybody who has gone into wars, this through history, um, the, the people who are the most convinced that that's the thing to do all regretted going into wars because of what wars are like. So the things that I would hope to convey is, first of all, what are the arcs? Is that right or wrong in the arcs? Measured, not opinionated. Just look at those measurements so that you could see that. And then as we think about it, like I, I, I have a principle. If you worry, you don't have to worry. And if you don't worry, you need to worry. And what I mean by that is if you worry and you start to think what this direction could be and what it's like, then um, maybe you deal with the things that prevent the, those worries, where if you don't worry, maybe you get into trouble without worrying or with a confidence. Uh, there are things we can do. The world has now more resources than it has ever had, and there are things that can be done. Now you're managing 150 billion plus? Yeah, about that. And why is it, explain this to me, I really don't know the answer. Hedge funds seem to come and go, sometimes they're hot, sometimes they're cold, sometimes they go out of business. You've been in business for almost uh, half a century and you've got 150 billion. What did you do that nobody else has been able to do? What we were able to do we, um, was to be able to structure portfolios in a way that were um, better in terms of the returns, risks, and correlations of our investors. So to give you that, uh, an idea, in other words, um, you could balance things in a way. I could take different alphas, different bets in different markets, and I could carry that and put that in a fund called Pure Alpha. Then I could take different asset classes and put that in a fund which was called Pure Beta. And then we could engineer it for the customer's risk levels. Do you want it at 12% vol, volatility, 18% vol, and then they would, whatever benchmark they wanted, we could put okay. the alpha on top of. So they could say, I want the S&P 500 plus uh, a 6% vol operating okay. that way. I know it all sounds complicated, but we could design and structure okay. things to their liking that would produce an attractive rich risk in return that also was not correlated with their other investment. Now you wrote a book a few years ago called Principles mm -hmm. that sold millions of copies. Usually books in the business world don't sell millions of copies and millions of them were sold in, in China as well. Um, what is it that was in that book that was so exciting to people? When I would make decisions, I would not just make the decisions, I would think about what are the criteria that I would use to make the decisions, and I'd write them down, those are the principles, and then in our culture, which is this idea of meritocracy, we would say, Does the, are those criteria good or bad? And then we would try to put them into algorithms and equations. And so in, I would do that almost like a diary kind of thing, 
and I would see the same things happening over and over again, and the next time it happened, I would go to the principal, and we could together go to our principals. And so it accumulated that over a period of time, and they were practical. They're not theoretical principles, and, and people seem to find them valuable. Now, it is said that you use these principles in your firm, and you operate the firm according to the principles, right, more or less. But it's very constant self-examination. Employees have to be self-examined by their peers. You're self-examined by your peers, right? There are other people in the firm. It's hard to get people to want to do this and to really be examined so intently over the years? Or? It's so logical, but that doesn't mean everybody wants to do it. Um, it's, um, so in one sentence, it's an idea meritocracy. You know, the best ideas win out from wherever they come from in which the goals are meaningful work and meaningful relationships, that we're in it together, uh, through radical truthfulness and radical transparency. Right. So if we disagree, that's a good thing. That's no reason to have anger. And to have the art of thoughtful disagreement and examine right. how do you scientifically find out what's true? How do you test things and so on? And that's been essential to our success. Right. So, you know, you're very intense, you're obviously into the numbers, but you're also big into transcendental meditation, right? Yeah, that's helped me a lot. It it's has. been uh, probably the mo uh, biggest, whatever success I've had, maybe more attributable to transcendental and meditation. And how did you get into transcendental meditation? The Beatles help you or something? Yeah, <laughs> you, you, yep, um, uh, it was exactly that. In, in 1968, the Beatles went to India and they meditated. And then uh, I heard about it, and then in 1969, uh, in New York, you could, um, uh, you can bring some flowers, and you could do that, and you could learn how to meditate. And, and wow, um, I recommend, it's the best thing, gift I you could do give it every day, or every? Almost every, uh, almost, uh, yeah, I try to do it every day, I try to do it about twice a day. And if I could take a second to ex describe it, um, um, what it is, um, is it frees your mind of thought and it takes you from a conscious state into your subconscious and your subconscious is where creativity okay. comes from and equanimity and, and, and all of that like if you're calm and great ideas come to you and when you have that equanimity then you as you're approaching everything things are just the way they are and you have to deal with them and it's a little like being you know in the uh, ninja movies, it's a little bit like being the ninja, and everything seems slower and you can handle it better. Right. And so and you align your subconscious, which is where the emotions and also inspirations come from, with your conscious mind, and when they're aligned and you have that equanimity, it's a great thing. You're going to write a book on transcendental meditation? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> what can the average person do to invest reasonably well? The most important thing you could do is not be in cash and, and those deposits, particularly at the, now when there's such negative real rates, and to have a, a well-diversified portfolio. Let me ask you this. The average person watching right now probably doesn't have $150 billion to manage the investment of. So what can the average person do to invest reasonably well? Well, you know, um, like, I didn't have any money, and I remember the cycle. And what, what it was is I would start to think, um, how much d m money do I have to, how many weeks, months, and then years can I take care of myself and my family? And I would calculate that. I would be at, okay, 52 years, if no income was going to come in. And then I would start to think, um, and then if I'm holding a portfolio in something, maybe I could lose half, so I better m cut that number in half. And then I start to think of what are my uses of the money? What do I need to do? And I would think about how do I immunize that? And you start and you build like that, and you know how to save. And, and saving, you know things like, don't put it into cash deposits that get eroded by inflation and taxes and so on, and you start to develop it. And the thing that you can do, the most important thing you could do is not be in cash and, and those deposits, particularly at the, now when there's such negative real rates, and to have a, a well-diversified portfolio. And that well-diversified portfolio, you know, that's a whole subject of what does that mean and how to do it, but it's a well-diversified portfolio of not just asset classes, 
but of uh, countries, of um, uh, uh, you know, of, of, of okay. different thing, currencies. Diversify, but let let me ask you: an uh, average person who isn't you know a billionaire, should they expect to get a rate of return overall on their money of five percent a year? Is that a good target? Six percent, eight percent? What do you think is a reasonable target for somebody who doesn't want to take undue risks? Well. Nowadays, the structure of the markets and where everything is priced um, if, um, and done the normal way will give you probably a return in the vicinity of, with a lot of risk around it, of maybe in the vicinity of 4%, okay. 3%, 3%, 3%, 4%. Okay, something that might not equal inflation, probably it'd be very close and then you have to pay taxes on it. Um, because there are so many financial assets. But you, one thing you can, they'll send you more money. As we talk today, uh, the stock market in the last couple of weeks has been correcting, if that's the right verb, and a lot of the air is out of the so-called bubble. Should people be selling everything and getting out of the market now because the markets are going down, or is this the time to buy? Uh, for, first of all, I'm, I'm not here to give a lot of advice, but I'll give you the following thoughts. Um, we won't tell anybody. Just give us a uh, Okay, <laughs> just okay. just on our own. Um, what's happened is the they produced a lot of debt and gave out a lot of money. And so everybody's got money, and it's also very easy to borrow money to buy things. And as a result, if you create much more buying power than you create goods and services, you've got a lot much more inflation. And the Federal Reserve has been behind the curve, slower to tighten monetary policy. And as a result, we're now starting to see the rise in interest rates to be able to deal with that. As that happens, all assets compete with each other. So now that free money is still going to be cheap money, but it's going to be um, a bit higher. So interest rates, let's say bond yields, have gone up about 1%. Now you take that and you adjust, everything is the present value of future cash flows, but it means that that interest rate goes up a percent. That means all the other assets have to adjust. We're in a process of making that kind of adjustment. That means the days that we've had before, the easy days where they dump money on you and you don't have much inflation and you don't have much tightness, those are past. And now we're in a different kind of part of the cycle. How do you foresee crypto impacting the world order? Uh, I think it's interesting. I have a tiny percentage of my portfolio on it to, to diversify. But it is a very vulnerable incident because they can track who is operating on it. It can be tracked. It'll be outlawed probably by different governments. And in terms of its size, it has issues. So I think too much attention is spent, spent on um, crypto or somebody might be a gold bug or somebody might be, I don't know, they hold gems or whatever they do. But I think that we're now in an era where we're going to have different types of money. We're going to question money is a medium of exchange, but it's also a storehold of wealth. And we're going to be questioning what are the right storehold of wealth in, in the value. And you're going to see around the world not only the digital versions of that take place in many forms, you're going to see other forms of, of that competition, right. I think, in the years ahead. We are not investing, and you're not uh, transcendental meditating, and you're not writing books and doing philanthropy. What are you doing? You have any outside number, interest? Number one is my grandkids. Okay. okay. My, my kids, my, my family, of course, um, and uh, the, one of the greatest blessings in, in life um, that one ever can possibly have is one's And How many grandchildren do you have? I have four now. What do they call you? Papa. Not Mr. Dalio or something like that. <laughs>